Welcome everybody to Tales from the Tackle Shop. This is season 13 and it's also our Christmas special. Christmas special? Where's your hat? <laughs> uh, still in the cracker. Didn't you get the memo? No. It was just wing it, I heard. There we go. In the festive spirit now. Bar humbug. Got my tree. Look. If I'd have known, if I'd have known, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's better. In the Christmas spirit. Right. Um, just so we just lit, we've just made an executive decision that because of the lack of uh, matches and anything happening with all the um, COVID restrictions, we're going to have a break next week. So no podcast next week, guys. So we'll just have a week off because otherwise we feel we're just kind of um, dragging this out. So we don't, we want to have something new to talk about. So maybe that week off over the Christmas period won't be a bad thing. So we'll be back first Wednesday in January. Yeah. And hopefully with some better news with the COVID situation. Right. Okay, buddy. Um, you had a match at the weekend. Had a fairly big match on the old course of the yeah. March. Yeah. Yeah, 65 people turned up, I think. Yeah, there was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's not a bad attendance, is it, really? No, no. It's, um, it would be a sellout normally, but with obviously everything going on, that was uh, soon down to what it was. So, I was going to video you at the end of yeah. the match, but there was two problems. One, you didn't let me know where you were. You were I was so, hiding. <laughs> you were so engrossed in your peg, you forgot to message me, or you just ignored me. I don't know which one. And I broke down, and I broke down again, so I couldn't get to you anyway. Well, you need a new engine, mate. That's what you need. It's the car better. I keep cleaning the bloody thing, but I'm not skilled in that department, so uh, I, I did buy a new one online. Just got to fit it. But yeah, my all my plans of coming down the river and videoing Alex went up in. Not thankfully smoke, but um, in a kind of like a splutter of petrol. So that didn't quite happen. But we'll get on to the match a bit later on. A um, couple of things. Let's just touch upon the tier system because it's got even more complicated with the introduction of... And it just... Yeah, yeah. The tier four and Peterborough, because obviously that's very close to home. So has it now kind of literally stopped all the small map matches, do you think? I think pretty much in Tier 4, yeah. I mean, there's... The problem is, that obviously, we're not very far from Peterborough at all. Um, Whittlesea isn't Tier 4, um, but is very close to <laughs> Tier 4. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a tricky one, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean... Um... I've got a couple of thoughts about this. I don't know what your thoughts are, but um, the angling, the local clubs have been, some have been really quite um, officious. Is probably officious is probably too strong a word, but been very, they've been very keen just to have anglers from their own tier, from their own club, in matches, which I understand because that was the advice given, wasn't it, by the angling trust, not to mix the tiers up. However, now with this introduction of tier four very close by. I think these angling clubs that were very keen to enforce the angling trust's advice owe it to their club members to now police their waters quite carefully over the next few weeks. So I'll give you an example. I saw on Facebook yesterday, Kingsland Angling Club, they had a two anglers from Tier 4 fishing their water, asked them to leave, refused. <laughs> um, the car itself... I don't know which tier it's from, but it actually wasn't from this country, looking at the number plates. But the anglers I were from tier four. The club did ask them to leave. They didn't leave. I mean, that's just complete selfishness. But at least Kings Lynn are doing the right thing. They're trying to mm. police their waters. I messaged Tony Jakes from Whittlesea yesterday, and they're a really well-organised club, particularly as far as... Well, you had Jeff Tuttleby is the match organiser, isn't he, for Whittlesea? Yeah, yeah. And I saw last week, bless him, that... Because he's he lives in Tier 4 now, I think, by the looks yeah. of things. He was trying to get the matches organised for last Saturday or was asking for people to help, knowing full well that at the time he was going to go into Tier 3. And then... Yeah, so he, he, he couldn't do the matches 
because he obviously lives in tier three, tier four. So he was asked because Whittlesey actually is tier two. Yes. Um, so obviously he was asking for people to run the match for him, and I don't think anyone come forward. Well, it's a shame because I mean he's he, he's very he's just a fantastic job organising those matches. However, yep. um, yeah, bless him. So he kind of like had to sort of throw. <laughs> He couldn't go himself and sort of like said to everybody, look, I'm in the wrong tier, I can't go. And um, But they were still trying to get things organised. And I know talking to Tony that the bailiffs are, they, they're they kind of like at this moment in time working out what they can do because they realise they've got a bit of a problem on their hands because they're so close to Peterborough that um, I think that they're, yeah, they're discussing it between themselves. And I think that's really, really proactive. So these clubs are really good. They've kind of like picked up the mantle. Bit disappointed with some other clubs, but who were very keen to ban some of their club members from match fishing. But <laughs> they've got anglers driving from all over the country to fish their waters um, for pleasure sessions. And I think if they they owe it to their club members, particularly the guys in different tiers that they couldn't let match fish, to police the waters a bit stronger, in my opinion. What do you think on that one, Alex? Um. I think as long as they make it clear, obviously we've got Facebook and that now, and as long as the club are making it clear for people, it's um, in in my eyes they can only put that information out, and then it's down to the individual. I, I think some people are, you know, narrow-minded, I suppose, and want to. They don't think about it. They think, oh well, it's only matches. I can still go pleasure fishing or whatever, but. I think the clubs obviously have to do as much as they can um, to make it sort of obvious that they're not sort of welcome if they're not in the same tier. Yeah, I mean, I think they should go a bit further, be a bit more heavy-handed, really. I mean, they could refuse to sell day tickets and call the police if they know they've got people in different tiers because it is getting daft. People are driving a long, long way to fish these waters, and quite openly, uh, they're actually making themselves look... A you know, a bit daft by putting things on social media and you're thinking, hold on a minute, this is all getting a bit out of hand. I just think with everything that's happening and with the match anglers from different tiers having these restrictions placed upon them by their own clubs, I think over the next couple of weeks it would be great to see um, club members helping their bailiffs out on the banks because otherwise it could get a little bit daft. You could end up people driving through tiers to get to certain fisheries, which in the current state of play is not on at all. Just as a side note, um, my partner was in a tier two Tesco's two days ago, and the woman in front of her was from tier four, and openly telling everybody that she'll go where the hell she likes to buy the clothes that she wants, and no one's going to stop her. And I think that's the problem we got, isn't it, at the minute? People are just saying, I'll do what I like. And I think everybody just needs to pull together with it. What about tackle shot wise? Is it, is it must be quite difficult for you, you know, in the yourself trying to make a make money. You've got a kind of um, how do you do that? Do you just stick to the num- the certain numbers in the shop at one any one time? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, match days and stuff like that. We have to be strict on how many people are in the shop and that um, because it. it is isn't a massive shop and it's pretty tight in there with stock and stuff. So, um, yeah, we have to be a bit careful with that. But um, obviously a lot of stuff's going out online. A lot of people are, are sort of opting for that. Um, it's a bit difficult with bait and that side of things to, to get that online. But um, uh, from what I've seen, everyone's been spot on. There's always an odd one or two that, um, you know, think they can do what they like um so yeah i think everyone's used to it now you know even if they haven't got a mask they come in and make sure that you know they're oh, sorry mate i've got my mask but, you know you see them doing all this business and stuff like that get what they want and they're off the go but 99 percent of them are absolutely spot on so you know you can't well, ask for any more really fenland's greatest angler did that last time i was in there yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. mate. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna. Santa's gonna have to go. I'm too hot. Hold on. I'm not used to something on top of my head. I'm overheating. I have to <laughs> forget the festive spirit. Right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. We well, do it very well because um. 
Obviously, I've been over a couple of times recently, and uh, everyone's been brilliant, really, haven't they? They're kind of shouting upstairs to you, how many people am I allowed up? And I think, generally, most people are really, really, you know, um, dealing with this very well. Okay, um, I've got something else as well I was going to throw at you. It's kind of a little bit of a... It's like a, someone's, a friend of mine's written me a little bit of a story. Um, stories, it's not a story, a bit of a, a summary of um, some local fishing that I didn't really realise what had happened until recently. Um, a bit of a sad state of affairs. And again, I'm going to read this out to you, Alex, and then ask you for your thoughts on it. What provoked, promoted this in my head is I saw, I think it was two weeks ago, the Angling Trust, no, the Environment Agency put on Facebook, they, they had recently stocked 500 barbel into the River Ival at Biggleswade, or it right. runs through Biggleswade. And I thought, that rings a bell. Why would they have done that? And then I started digging around, and uh, a friend of mine called Oliver Jenkinson has written me a script, so I'll read it out to you. It's, it's really quite interesting what happened. Um, he was originally from Biggleswade and learnt to fish on the Ival, and he started in 2006, and he was a child. He, he knew very little about the barbel that inhabited the river, but as he got older, his angling knowledge improved, and he began to realise that he had something quite special on his doorstep. Uh, in his early teens, he started targeting the barbel. This was around 2013, and there were some huge fish coming out, with some reaching upper double figures. Now, I used to have my pipe rods made by a rod builder in Biggleswade, whose name escapes me, and this... Was about twenty. Archie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's his What's his full name? John. Um, John Hutchison. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 Made me some smashing rods, and he was talking to me about the barbell back then, which was a long time ago. Um, but obviously, we're now up to two thousand and thirteen. He said, at this point, the Ivor was well known as a specimen barbell river, with anglers travelling from all over the country to fish it. There were plenty of big barbel being caught, as well as chub and perch too. Uh, February 2015, I caught a new personal best barbel weighing £14.7, and I'm guessing he was only 16 at the time. And he said, and this was an average size fish for what was there at the time. So there must have been some clonkers. Um, close season 2015, when I first heard of barbel being otted, uh, found by a barbel angler, I knew it had been and I knew it had been dragged onto towpath and displayed typical signs of being attacked by an otter with bite marks to the throat. From then on, more and more fish were being spotted and reported dragged onto the bank or into far bank undergrowth, again displaying typical otter marks. A number of big barbel were found, as well as big chub. Uh, despite the otter attacks, I was lucky enough to catch my £15.4 personal best barbel just after the season had opened again in 2015. Although just a few months later, the biggest barbel in the river was found by two friends of mine one evening, still half alive and taking its final breaths. It had had its throat ripped open by an otter, um, which had been startled by the two guys' head torches as they walked down the river. My same friend had caught that same barbel earlier in the winter, January 2015, at £19.9. This a big fish. Yeah, this barbel had also been caught at £20.7 when it hit the headlines in the angling magazines. Nowadays, the Ival is a shadow of its former self and the barbel numbers have plummeted. The EA have done a stocking programme and have stocked a number of juvenile barbel into the Ival at Biggleswade. Um, some of these fish are getting caught by anglers, however, the larger original Ival fish seem far, very few and far between. The chub are making a comeback, and there are now a good number of large roach getting caught. And he's put down here, possibly due to less barbel and therefore less competition for food, which he's probably correct. The barbel are now in such low numbers these days, however, that many anglers that used to fish for them, myself included, do not bother anymore. <clears throat> and that's a real shame because that was a, that river was an absolute gem for quite some time, but it's been absolutely destroyed. Now, this is my question. If there's an obvious predator problem with the otters on this river, for example, because there's no doubt, no one can dispute that the otters destroyed the barbel fishing on this river and the chub fishing and the big perch. I just wonder why the restocking program has taken place because in my head, they're just, the EA are just putting barbel food, um, otter food via barbel back into the river. 
And uh, I'd have thought it would make more sense to try and do something about the predators first or have some kind of study on the rivers to see what the problem is rather than just blindly throwing this barbel back in. Because I know what's happening at the minute. The otters aren't touching these small barbel. Uh, I think the EA put little blue dots on their bellies and so they can recognise the stockfish. Yeah. However, once they get to a certain size, they'll start becoming again hit by the otters and it, it will just be a, a repetitive problem and uh, I, I was just a bit I don't know didn't quite understand the logic of just just restocking with fish that had obviously been destroyed by these otters um, yeah I just wondered what your thoughts were on that one do you agree with what I've said or do you have a different mindset to it um, I know exactly what you mean um I don't know. I mean, what can you do about otters? Well, that's the perennial question, isn't it? Because they were int- unless someone knows different, and I've got this completely wrong. There wasn't any kind of um, mini scheme in place to just observe what would happen when an apex predator was re- reintroduced into the wild. So, in my head, it would have made more sense to reintroduce otters into one small area of the country and monitor nice. them and then see what problems they would have caused with the ecosystem but as we know that didn't happen they were like something like 800 breeding pairs released into norfolk suffolk and cambridgeshire by the otter trust alone so it was just on mass there you go so i don't know i think this otter problem is not going to go away i just think it's just going to keep raising its head Unless, of course, the otter population drops right down to a natural level. But I, what that is, I have no idea. I'm not a, an expert in this. But it just seems that there's been so much carnage caused by in, reintroducing otters that it's still ongoing. I mean, the ivor was just completely wiped out. So it's just going to get yeah. wiped out again when these fish get to a certain size. I can't see how that situation is going to change. However... If someone's got far greater knowledge on this than myself, if you could let us know. I didn't know what your thoughts were, because you guys must kind of worry about it daily with the fishery. Um, obviously, yeah. I mean, some fisheries, the smaller ones, can have a lot of fencing, um, which does help. But the size of the fishery we've got, we just can't physically afford to, to no. do an fence all no. the way around and have all the gates and people leaving gates open um touch wood we've not had a problem um we have mink traps we've got sort of i don't know 10 12 traps all set around the fishery um and you know they're checked daily and um we we do get a few of them we normally get little runs of them you get a week where you'll get three or four in a week and then you won't have any for months um so i mean Mink are a totally different ball game to otter, but um, at the minute we're uh, just maintaining the mink and keeping an eye on those because obviously some people do mistake, you know, a barbel attack for a mink attack. Um, but I mean, the otters do tend to go for the bigger fish in the pond, don't they? It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas a mink, I think, will just go for anything in general. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how, how we have to do it. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to say, oh, we're going to have a lot of fencing all the way around, but it just isn't viable. No, no, it's not viable at all. <clears throat> just makes, there are so many threats to angling at the minute. Yeah. But, um, and there never is a common sense approach taken to any of this. It just worries me about the future of angling. Um, not to knock commercials because they have a very important place in fishing, but I'd hate to think in 20, 30 years' time, the only angling that's taken place is on commercial venues because the wild venues have mm. been destroyed. And it does worry me. I think in certain situations, we're on a bit of a knife edge with it all, really. Um, if it's not illegal fish removal, it's cormorants. If it's not cormorants, it's otters. If it's not otters, it's saltwater incursion. Do you know what I mean? It's like there's an endless yeah. list of um, problems for our natural environment and it can only take so much hammer and it's just going to implode um i know the silverfish fishing is fantastic 
in the natural venues at the minute. But that worries me as well because nature has a way of balancing itself out. So with a lack of pike, for example, to curb a lot of the silverfish, we've seen the rise in perch stocks, huge perch, which are coming on, I'll come on to in a bit, huge, huge perch coming out of fen drains, uh, big rudd because there's been a, a shift in the biomass, there's probably a lot less bream around now because of the netting. And it just worries me that, you know, you, we've got bird flu at the minute going around. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some kind of fish virus that crops up in the next year or two that wipes out a whole number of silverfish because we don't have the the predators there to eat the mm -hmm. sick fish because that's what they do. That's part of their role within the environment. You know, pike will take the sick and injured fish fit first because they're easy for them to catch. And that's an important role that they play in any healthy ecosystem. You need to have very healthy predator stocks as well. So I don't know, mate, the whole thing, I just I hope I'm wrong. I just think that we've got so many pressures on our natural venues. If we're not careful, we're going to have really big problems in the future. So I don't know. Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, same really you've obviously got meat and crabs crayfish yeah or other things like that as well um i know things go in cycles but i think the cormorant side of things is is it's the biggest thing for for the fishing that i do definitely you know um they uh they just devastate venues don't they and yeah. the basically i mean in one way, it's good for the for the drains and stuff for the small fish because they hurdle them all up in certain areas and it's like a mini commercial almost where the fish don't go out certain areas through the winter. But um, I don't know. For me, the cormorant thing is, is, a, is a big issue, definitely. But um, what can we do? What, what What is the, you know, the, the ad petitions and that to, to get them on the list of birds to, to shoot? Uh, obviously, you can get licensed and shoot five, but um, I mean, this time of year especially is, is they devastate loads of venues where there's less anglers about because of the weather, and they just home in and hurdle all the fish into one corner and completely massacre it. But oh, well, you're right. And um, also, the cormorant, I think, I think if I'm right, is protected under the, an EU generic title at the minute. Uh, now, someone might correct me. I'm sure this is correct though. I think there was a, um, a an error, a administrative error when they protected the cormorants. It right. was meant to be specific strains of cormorant that needed to be protected. So, for example, our coastal shag is an endangered species, mm. but it comes under the family of cormorant. And yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that oh, this is correct, that when it went through in Brussels to protect these birds, they just used the generic term. So they right. all got protected right. because a lot of the cormorants that we, the, the problems that we have aren't our indigenous species of cormorant. These are actually, I think they're Asian or European cormorants. I can't remember which one it is now. In the, the mid ones. in the mid 80s, there was a massive influx of these new cormorants into Europe. And they've just literally taken over from the mm. indigenous cormorant species. And this is the problem that we've got. They're not even... Um, birds that should be here that's the problem yeah and yet they're protected under this banner so yeah you're right i mean i think i think i could live with the otter problem if the cormorant situation and the illegal fish removal situation had been dealt with far better i think we'd have a chance but we're so <laughs> these poor fish get absolutely if they're not escaping a net they've got to escape big black bird trying to eat them and they get to a certain size, they get in the winter in particular, when they get very slow and lethargic, they become easy prey for for otters. So, yeah, it doesn't look great, I'm afraid, in lots of situations. Um, the problem is, like you said, there's very little that we can do about it as individual anglers. So I don't know what the answer is for that. Sorry, mate, my GoPro just stopped again. Is yours going still? I think so, mate, yeah. Is it blinking at you? Yeah. 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 I think every now and again, mine gets bored of me talking and just turns itself off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, before we get on to the match results, or the match results, um, what do you reckon to these? 
Can you see those? Oh, official baits banned. What do you reckon to that? Look at that. What is it? Cockroach or something? No, it's a. It's a. I'm going to get this one wrong. Let me just remind myself. It's a beaver bug. It's a creature bait made by Tom Moyer of FFS Lures. Got another one here. We've got um, this is called the Fang. No, that looks like a crayfish. Yes, that looks like a crayfish. And the clever thing is, they've actually got um. Don't know if you can see that. They've got like yeah. a, a little um hole which holds air, and it will sit upright when you rig it. So that sits up in the water. It's really nice. good. These things, believe it or not, are di- they're absolutely dynamic. These are floating, f- floating finesse sticks. So that's another type of creature bait. I've got that one on a Ned rig at the minute. That just sits up in the water and you, you tease it back. I thought it was meant to look like a worm, but a lot of people think it looks like a, a fish silhouette on the bottom. No. Yeah. This is quite cool as well. Look at this. This worm's got a hollow tip, and that will sit up in the water like that. And that's very good for Carolina rig. Yeah, so all sorts of things. So I've been using a few of these lately and experimenting. And as I said a few minutes ago, there are some big perch around. So I'll put a picture up somewhere on this screen. And, uh, yeah, we've been getting some really, really big what, perch. What, you caught it, or did oh, someone else No, catch I it? actually caught these, yeah. So I've been catching some really big perch on these creature baits. Plus other things as well, but these things have been. It must re- work if you caught one. <laughs> have been really doing the damage. It's ever so interesting, from my p- point of view, being a lure angler who fishes with shads and big plastic lures, just experimenting with little things like this. At, at first, I thought that's never going to work, but actually, they are brilliant, and uh, you can fish them very, very negatively. And the hits you get on these things with really light tackle are amazing. The doof, when the big old perch picks up and thumps your rod tip. I mean, I know people have had some very big pike on these things. They're very oh, subtle. On, on that? Yeah, yeah. I know, it's incredible. Yeah. It's all very new to me, and I'm just sort of playing with it. But it's already got me really, really intrigued because um, these big fish are really, really homing in on it. Obviously, you've got to be in the right area. And pulling it past very close to their noses but when they see it they're well they don't want a moving shad or a bigger moving bait when you put these things over their heads they absolutely destroy them it's incredible they hit them so hard so that's been quite intriguing so uh more to this more of this to come and uh, i'll put some links up here somewhere so if people want to know how to rig these things, we did a few videos a few weeks ago. So I'll put the link up for some of those videos and you can have a look. So this is one of these up and coming things up in the sport, this finesse type fishing, where you use very light gear, light rod, very light line. A bit like going back to match fishing style, really. Um, you know, sort of finesse stuff. You might be using just something like a BB in weight just to get your, 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 your bait down to the bottom. Or fishing it in a certain way so it's just off the bottom there's a multitude of different rigs that you can use and approaches and uh, yeah it's been really really interesting doing this so um something i'm starting to get into and it's thrown up some really big fish so it's an interesting way of doing it and also because you've got that sensitivity you can feel everything that's happening so really intrigued by it but um we'll do more on this in the future because um, i plan to do a few videos on it because i'm an absolute newbie with this style and uh made a few mistakes already but i'll take a few people through it and uh yeah if you're interested and want to buy some of these baits you could go um a lot you could do worse than look at tom's website which is www.ffslures.com um he's got all the baits on there and he's absolutely inundated he hand pours them himself and yeah it's going great guns for him so it's good stuff yeah just thought I'd drop that in, Alex, because uh, when something's really good and someone local's pushing things, I think yes. it's good just to hear Definitely. it. Hear it. Right, okay, let's get on to more Big Red Maggot-related subjects. Had big the, Red Maggot? Big Red Maggot. You had the March well, open. Well, we'll start with, there was some club matches, because there is a couple of clubs in Tier 2 still. Cool. Um, 
So we start with Ramsey. Um, obviously, the uh, the big midweek match, um, as always, um, was won by myself. Eighteen pound nine. Um, <laughs> I think it messed me in the phone keeps falling over. Um, eighteen pound nine. So um, drew a good peg and um, yeah. Had a nice day's fishing. 17-6, Mount Plant. Second, third, John Locke. And fourth was Keith. Keith, don't show us your teeth. With 15-3 and 15-5. So, had a nice little battle down there. Was that down at Ramsey St Mary's? Yeah, that was at St Mary's. Um, I think they've got a match there again this Wednesday. Um, Which I think will be quite hit as well. Because quite a few of them lads come from Peterborough. I know like Ivan Steele's. He's, he lives in Peterborough, so he can't go, and his brother and, and so forth. So um, it's going to affect yeah. the areas quite badly. Um, are you fishing it Sunday... Wednesday? Sorry, mate, are you, are, you going, Sorry? are you fishing it again Wednesday? No, no, I shan't be there Wednesday. Um, I think you're banned, it's... aren't you, to give them a chance? Sorry? I should think you're banned to give them a chance. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just a ni- nice, friendly match. It's five calls. It's, you know... I do like going down there and, and catching yeah. different methods. Um, Is it your sixth win um, on the trot or something down there? Um, possibly, yeah. yeah. I think it might be, yeah. 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 You get a little grin there. You do like it. Yeah. 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 Um, and then Sunday they had their Christmas match, but it was at Factory Bank, um, which is the first match that's really been on, on Factory this year. It's, um, so it's had a bit of rest, but it normally, it normally gets hammered sort of just before Christmas and especially after Christmas, but um, maybe it's a blessing in disguise for the venue, the fish will, you know, come back a bit stronger. But uh, match winner from peg, I don't know, 10, 11, something like that, which is near the crash barrier area for people that know it, was big red maggot specialist Paul Kilby, um, which is Andrew Concrete Kilby's brother, um, with 16, 11. Mouth plant was on peg one, which is, is the flyer end normally 14 15 and then Colgate Keith Raymond obviously was third 14 11 and then John Locke was fourth and 13 11 so decent weights nice to see some fish coming out of factory so who knows there might be some little knock ups on there over Christmas I'm sure there'll be something about um because when the fish are in it's, it's nice fishing yeah it's nice fishing what is it mainly roach yeah roach a few perch get a lot of uh, small pike down there as well um you get quite a few angles come in the shop for dead baits and that that will go down there and catch plenty of fish um it's just one of them venues one the fish are in the fish are in and it's um good fishing yeah uh, yeah um the other club match was the st ives angle club had their christmas match as well um i mean all these matches they're Classes Christmas matches, but there's no sort of prize giving and all that sort of thing afterwards. Obviously, with social distancing, um, so normally they'd be on St Ives, obviously, but um, with the river sort of too fast and coloured and, and out of sorts, they um, switched to Ramsey St Mary's. Seems as the Ramsey boys were on factory. There's about twelve fished it, so a decent turnout for St Ives boys. Um, Kev Watkins was out on top with twelve ten. Um, Dave Milburn was second with 12-4 and then Rob Humphreys you either got it or you ain't had £11.10 for third so um, there's obviously a joke an in joke there somewhere but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so he was third um, so I think they enjoyed it comfortable fishing part behind your peg um, it's a bit muddy but where isn't with the rain and stuff yeah, yeah. um it's, uh, so yeah, they, they're the only club matches I can find. Tid had on. Tid did their winter one, didn't they? Their Christmas one on Chamber. Yeah, Ridge. I haven't seen the result yet though. Yeah, uh, I wish I dug it. Uh, oh, well, John Taylor won it. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. He drew drew pants at March, so yeah. he went and uh, yeah, fished the uh, the big Tid match at, on twenty first. I mean, I was thinking about that. Actually, the, this morning or yesterday, is that a bit naughty or is that clever angling? Um, I'll sit on the fence with that one. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> part of you has a. I think if you're in a match, you're in a match, aren't you? So you've got kind of an obligation to fish it. 
But then again, if you know you've got no chance because of where you're drawn, I can understand. I can I can see both sides. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, March is one of them venues. I mean, I don't know whereabouts you do at March, but um, I'm, you know, I always park in the old allotments car park and walk pretty much somewhere near there. So Hold on. I, I think you, you always can have a day's fishing. I wasn't going to get the little violin out just yet, but all in a minute. Oh, right, yeah. 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 Well, you know, I said, I think I said to you last week, I had my jaws in the, in the small club matches, I draw the flyers, and then uh, when it comes to the big matches, I tend to be the furthest section away from the fish. But okay, let's get straight onto this then, because um, that's the cookie crumble. Isn't yeah, it? where was peg one this time? At March, so peg one was again. This is frustrating. Peg one was five below the Wigston's Bridge, so just before the disabled platforms. Right. Yeah. Um. There's People went in the week and they were catching plenty of fish at Wigston's. So it was looking good for them to catch fish, which they did. But like it was sort of five weeks ago, as soon as you got to the disabled pegs back towards what we would class as peg one, through the narrows and into the trees there at sort of uh, the back of Waterside Gardens and that, um, it's just been awful by March standards. Um Poor old Ray Malley drew peg one again, and he's caught next to nothing, just a little perch for most of the day, and then caught a few roach after a while. Yeah, peg above him, uh, Mark Pollard's had 18 pounds, he's got 19 pounds, 24 pounds, uh, 24 pounds, no, 26 pound Paul Spriggs, and an 18 pound the other side of the bridge at 21 pounds, 14 pounds. And then they're like sixteen pound on the wow. culvert, so it's amazing. Something's obviously pushing them up. They don't want to go away from that area, which is very strange. You know, normally draw where Ray's been all the way through the um, the sable pegs up to the narrows. You're looking to catch twenty pound. It's a really good area, but I don't know. I think something's not right, but I don't know what. I think it may be Cormans pushing them up that far. Um, they are getting bolder. Yeah, <clears throat> those cormorants are getting yeah. they're getting a lot bolder. They get they don't they don't they don't take off now when they first see you. They um hang around. No, no, no. Okay, so that was and did were were so Neem Parade has obviously missed out. And then did the pegs yeah, start Neem again? Yeah, Neem Parade's not been in for years. Did you Sorry? did you have any pegs opposite the ship? Uh, no, there's no pegs underneath the clock. They weren't used. The, what was peg 11 was the, I think, the peg that basically won the last team match that was on there with £65. I think he had 20, £21 off that peg. And then Craig Nicholas drew the peg to the left of that. May, don't quite, it may even been the same peg he had in the Winter League and he had £31. Hang on. £31.10. So he had a cracking day's fishing. Um, I think he caught on hemp, lots of roach. Um, there were skimmers caught all the way through, but not like they have been in pleasure fishing. People have been catching a lot of skimmers in all the way through. Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought it was going to fish its brains out, to be honest. Um, I had some, a little cold snap, and then it's just gone warm, and I felt that it would be fished really, really well. And even when I got to my peg, you know, people and, and all the way through where I was, there's odd fish topping at the start. I think as soon as we started, I never see one fish top. Um, and March isn't a venue where they do show themselves. They don't top very often. So I was sort of setting up. I thought this could be good today and you could see them. And they were good fish. But um, no, it just for whatever reason, it just didn't it didn't fish as well as it normally does. Um but still, brilliant weights, you know. If you the them those weights five six years ago, everyone will be saying how fantastic it's fished. But um, it's the fish don't seem to be, or well, they're not feeding in the numbers like they were five six weeks ago. Um, and why there's no fish in them low numbers, I don't know. Oh, very strange. It's very strange. I don't know what's going on. There, I think there's so. a lot of fish still at the bypass, but we just can't 
get the access to it to get up there. Yeah. Um, I went for sort of a pleasure session. When was it? Um, during the last lockdown, if you want to call it, and sat near the boats, and I probably caught 35 to 36 pound in four hours up there. It was absolutely rigid with fish. Um, no, like bonus fish, they were all but a good stamp of roach, good stamp of rud. Um, fish chuck on a waggler, you can catch on worms. I think Bob has done some live feeds on there, and it's just heaving with fish up there. So, whether them fish are still there or not, I don't know. I think they, they are, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's interesting, um, it's, it's nice that nothing stays the same. Um, yeah. Bit like, the, bit like the river live already nothing nothing lasts forever <laughs> but no, um no. obviously you know these fish are they got fins they got they move don't they they don't just stay in one spot and it's it makes it more interesting in a way so that yeah the old coal shed section that section near the railway bridge which was always a really good section of the matches the last three or four years i think um it's interesting that those fish have just moved out of that totally very strange you've got sorry it's very strange that the fish have moved completely out of that first the traditional first section at March near the near the old coal sheds. Yeah, yeah, it's very strange. Um, well, we don't fish the coal yard anymore. No, you know what I mean. That that, fir- that first section by the railway bridge. Yeah, up. yeah. Like you I mean, that's where the fish could be because I know there's a lot of boats along the coal yard there now, and if people are living on, which I think yeah. quite a few of them do, um, it's going to hold a lot of fish. No, what I meant was where you've traditionally caught the fish in the matches, those yep. first few pegs. It's now a bit barren, which is very strange. So, uh, but like I said, things you know things change, and the fish have got fins, and they have moved. Cool, right? So, how did you fish your match then? What did you do? Because you drew the allotments, your favourite area. Yeah, and yeah. Not without you being big headed, I'll do it for you. Did you come six, and you were kind of like the highest weight out of? No, the favorite... I think I was seven or eight. I think. Right, but you you've yeah. got a good weight considering you weren't in the um, favoured area. Yeah, I had a lovely day to be honest. Um, it's it's one of them pegs for those that people know it. We call it the allotments. Obviously, there's no allotments there now. So I think people going down, they must think, well, where's these allotments? Um, but basically, if you park in the old council yard, as it's called, which was the old allotments car park, um, you just walk straight through and you sort of come down the slope. And the first peg you see is like a concrete culvert. I don't know whether it still is in use or anything, but um, that peg wasn't used for a long time. Um, but it's always used now. It's an awkward peg to get in, and I was to the left of that. Um, basically, the peg I've drawn, it's sort of... The bank's all eroded, like most of the pegs at March now. You have to get in with a platform, and you've got the trees over the top of your head. And it's just on the bend. So it's a, it's a weird one. When it's flowing... You sort of everything wants to run towards your bank almost, um, which is which is a bit different. It's when you sort of got a bit of pace and you want it nice and straight, but it sort of runs at sort of that angle. Um, so when you plumb up, it plumbs up the shelf, sort of goes like that as well. So it's um, it's a weird peg to fish, um, but you've got depth short. I think because on boats come round short as well as coming round long so it's um it's it's not a good peg none of them pegs through there are any good um obviously the most noted one through there is the windmill peg that has got a bit of form because it's got a bit of room um so i sort of got to my peg looked at the river it was just moving and i thought oh this, this is perfect nice little tinge of color and then by the time we were setting up, it just got a little bit quicker, a little bit quicker, and I thought, oh, it, it weren't fast. It was perfect. Do you know what I mean? It was it was a lovely pace. But when it flows like that and it was starting to drop, it dropped quite a bit through the day as well. And um, when it flows, it takes all the colour. I think when it sort of, the colour builds up and then it just gets clearer and clearer and the fishing just gets harder and harder as the, as the day goes on normally. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I fed a line at top kit plus two of a short dolly butt, which was the deepest part of the peg, slightly down the stream. There's still a bit of weed about as well. You'd think it'd all be dead by now, but there was not a bit of weed. Um, and I just fed two balls of my usual ground bait mix, um, which is um, super canal black, 
Canal Noir. Um, and that's it, really. As simple a mix as that. And a few pinkies. I, di- I didn't want to put too much in because uh, I thought there might be a few skimmers feeding. So if there's a few skimmers about, I don't like to put too much loose feed in the, in the actual ground bait because I don't think they like it. I think if you were being aggressive for roach, I think you can feed more pinkies in a tighter ball and catch your fish right over the top. Whereas I think these skimmers are more sort of, this, they're floating about and they're not really feeding, if you know what I mean. Um, so I've had three balls there and then at um, basically 10 and a half metres where it's starting to come up, which is about two and a half foot, I suppose. And I've had three balls there slightly down peg because normally at March when it flows like that, the fish will, will come above your feed sometimes. And if you feed your ground bait or bread or whatever you're doing it's straight in front of you, a lot of the time you're missing out on fish. Right, yeah. Um, because you're putting your rig in and you're running past them, yet yeah. the fish are sat here. Why do you reckon they do Whereas that? Move, you... move above your bait? Sorry? Why do you reckon they move above your bait? Because uh, they're hungry. If you watch fish feed, they swim up river, don't they? If they're feeding, they swim up river. And I think when there's lots of fish competing, they're getting up moving right. in front of I've it got you. Yeah. They, they, they don't they don't recognize where the food's coming in they think it's food's coming down so yeah they're moving up to intercept it and they're going past where you've introduced it oh, i got you yeah yeah, yeah makes yeah. sense so um that's that line and then obviously the traditional um big pot of them and a few pinkies at 11 meters in, in probably about that depth of water i suppose um i felt I felt I was going to catch on empty because of the pace. I thought, I fancy the empty today. And um, so I set a range of rigs up. I, although it was moving nice, I didn't set up too heavy. I think a lot of anglers do fish a little bit too heavy for the pace of the river. I think like we've touched on with the flat floats and that, you, although it's moving fast, it's, it's only shallow, so you, you don't need as heavy rig. Um so rigs are set up. I set up a 0. 0.6 and a 0. 0.8 rig for fishing um, if it was going to be good and for fishing short in the deeper water. Just two droppers, real simple, sort of a 22s up. Um, 08 hook lengths, 22s. Um, I use a Series 4, which is very similar to the old, uh, for those, and so you can see that there. You can see that there. That's the old 311s. Um, which is, they don't make them anymore. So the ones that have have basically the same hook is Census 3210 and then the hooks that I use, which is a Series 4. um, Sorry, mate, what size are they? Um, Well, they're they're 18s or whatever they are, but I use the 22. Right, 22s, Um, yeah. Yeah. And then I add a range of rigs from 4x10 up to like 4x14, nice strung out squat rigs. Just rigs that you can sort of move your shot up and down. They'll fish slightly differently. Um, 010 main line, five inch hook clinks, and decent lashes as well. When it's flowing like that, you, there's no point shortening your rig. You want as long a line as you can get away with, really, depending on the wind. And um, I, I always fish a little back shot at March because of the skim. Some people don't, but that's just the way I fish it. I, I've, on all the drains, I fish a little back shot. And um, with that pace, you could just not overshot it, but you could pretty much get it to run just nicely. Um, so, yeah, started short. I had not a brilliant start. It was a slow start. Um, caught a few fish. What fish I caught were nice stamped down the middle over that line. I started flirting a few pinkies in um, after, like, five, ten minutes because I thought... Mm. They're not sitting right over the ground bait. There's a, there's, you get a nice couple and then they're dropping down. And I thought, oh. so I flared a few pinkies in. And um, within sort of two or three runs through, I hooked a skimmer and it come off. I thought, oh, no. Um, not a big skimmer, like four to six ounce one. But if you can get them skimmers in your peg, you can soon put weight together. Um, run through again, caught another couple of roach, odd perch, traditional little micro wasps. That's always a telltale sign you're doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, so just did my rig a little bit um, and started putting my rig in right above, literally above the ground bait, near right underneath where my pinkies were landing. 
put it in and I had like two six ounce skimmers in two chucks. And it was like, oh, they sat right under the loose feed. And then you go in again, you don't catch one. No. Really strange them skimmers. I, I, um, I don't know. I can't affect the way of catching them skimmers at the minute. They're, they're, um, funny fish as well. And because I was using fairly small hooks, you could, on, I started on a, on a bigger hook, like a, a 20 sort of heavy gauge, um, on some of my rigs, thinking, oh, here we go. It's going to be good now. And your bites just, absolutely just, you, you run your rig through, there's no fish in your peg. I, I find those um, skimmers out there, because obviously I was fishing from a lot in the summer. You mm-hmm. get two or three, and then nothing. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're not like, um, I think that's just skimmer fishing in general, but these ones on here, they do fight. They're weird. They're, yeah. They, they probably pull back. Do you but know what like, I mean? I was getting I know. like pound jobs out here. And this was the weird yeah. thing. If I, because it was a summer, it was completely different. If I introduced yeah. like ground bait, they would home in on it. Yeah. And I'd see them bubbling. And if I drop my rig on the bubbles, you get a bite yeah. instantly. If you were six inches off the bubbles, you didn't get a bite. I did it so many times, just moving the rig. And you see these like, every now and again, you get bloop, and you drop your rig on your bubbles. And the float yeah. will literally just cock and go straight under, skimmer about a pound. And mm-hmm. I, I thought, these are such flighty fish. They like, you get two or three, and they kind of scare, yeah. scare each other off. Yet when you put the ground bait in, they actively want it, and they they get co- yeah. they come back in on it. Yet they won't move away. They, they seem to get very tight, and that was in the summer. So God knows what it's like this time of year for you guys when it's cold and yeah, they, well, they don't, really don't want it. I think they just sit in that flow and they sit off the bottom a lot of the time as well. Yeah, and I think they just they just sort of snatch at things from going past them. Yeah, and I only caught four maybe five, six-ounce skimmers. I, I had three come off, which is very frustrating, you know, because especially when, like, 19 four and 20-pound ten's got you in the frame, and you know it's like it doesn't matter what hook size or anything. You just know they're not hooked properly. Yeah. And it was the same with the roach as well yesterday. The, the bites were tiny little bites, and, you know, you ship them back and they're coming off, and you think, why are they coming off? They never come off. You know what I mean? And it's because they're not, they weren't feeding aggressively. Um, and you sort of almost have to put it in their mouths for them to take it. Um, so that uh, that sort of middle line lasted probably, I, I probably stayed on it too long, to be honest. I, I sort of, after an hour, I'd, I'd sort of decided that that line had died on me. I didn't top it up. Uh, perhaps should have done. Um, but I just felt that that wasn't going to be the line where I could build a weight from. There just wasn't fish to come in continuously. And we've like, uh, so after an hour, I'd come off it. But for the 10 minutes before, I was just dinking a few squats on that sort of 10 meter line. Um, just up stream slightly. Um, that's another thing you don't, you don't, even though it's flowing hard, people think you fed squats and that flow. Yeah. It's only shallow. Yeah. So it doesn't take them long to hit the bottom. No. Um, and they're looking for it. You know, it doesn't matter where they hit the bottom. There's the fish are competing. So, um, I dropped in on a uh, four by fourteen little bulk down rig. Dropped in just above my bait. Just let it run through. Clonk, clonk, clonk. I thought, yeah, this is the line. You just get that feeling. You know, it's dead right. The fish are there. Um, then after like seven or eight fish, nice little dumpy roach. I started to fade and I thought, oh, it's, it's one of them days today. You have to work out a bit harder and move about more. So from from what I've learned fishing March over the years, even though you're loose feeding and it's flowing like that, you have to get your feeding dead right. I mean, it's, when you're squat fishing, it's all about getting in a rhythm and stuff like that. But it's almost you have to feed to your bites with the squats um, because you, you feed – and you get a response instantly, and they're like sat right where the feeds hit the water, and you're like clonk, clonk, clonk. You're like, here we go. And then you get carried away almost, and you feed too much and too regularly, or you miss a bite, so you feed again, and then all of a sudden they drop right down your peg. And it's um, a weird way of feeding it, but it's almost like um, you feed it like you do on hemp. It's like you feed it to get a response to bring them in, catch a few. And then when they back off, you have to feed it again. It was, 
but every day is different. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the beauty about fishing, isn't it? But yeah. um, I could catch, the water level dropped quite a bit. Um, and I could catch, I would say two, three inches was probably best off the deck. Um, just in fact, you weren't getting no weed. And I think that's the depth the fish wanted it at. Um, I think I had one skimmer off that line, even though it's only probably that much shallower than the deepest part. And skimmers don't seem to want to be there. They want to be down the middle. Um, and that kept tailing on me. So I topped it up a couple of times and you get a response. But I don't like to top up too much because every time you top up, you run the fish get less and less. So um, sort of changing your rigs and working at it. And then the last sort of, I don't know, last hour we had... I had some people on the far bank um, just come down and the little kids shouting and richly on top of your rig, but still carried on catching. But, you know, you put your next section on and go a bit further and you get lighter and lighter. And in the end, you're flicking your rig out with a longer lash. And, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing was hook size for me. Um, you know, you, you could fish the conventional sort of 20s hooks at March and you'd get a response, but putting smaller hooks on definitely made a big difference and, and hook bait as well. So yeah, I enjoyed it, mate. 19 pounds, lovely days fishing. Um, got wet boot where I went over the top of my boot, <laughs> but thank God for ski, um, seal skin socks. Cause um, I think we're still all right. But just when I pulled my boot out of the end, the whole <laughs> bottom of the leg was, was uh, wet through. So, so are you buying your dad a complete all-in-one sk- seat no, skin? No, yeah. I think I think <laughs> the poor old dad was broken, uh, <laughs> mentally broken. What happened Bless to him? him? Well, every time I every time I ask him about it, something else he tells me that went wrong. So I don't ask him anymore. I think he fell down the bank not once, twice, <laughs> and the second time he went straight on top of his box and hurt his. And, banged his head and nose and he had all blood on his nose when he come home <laughs> broke the tip of his rod when he fell over oh, and, no. and then broke two number four sections as well so oh did he go in yeah, yeah. did he yeah. actually go in yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so he had the old frank spencer moment <laughs> Yeah, bless, bless him. him. So, oh dear! I tell you what, those banks along there at the minute are treacherous, aren't they? They're some, horrific, some, mate. Yeah. yeah, some of those pegs. It's just uh, oh, I don't envy you, you lot. Sort of uh, <laughs> doing the the mud dance to get to your pegs. Horrendous. Um, have you got the top three or top five for the match? Yeah. So Craig Nicholas won it with thirty-one ten, I think. Second was Paul Spriggs. Sprigster, he was the first peg below Wigston's Bridge on the Brambles. He had 26 a pound. Third was Robert Hubbard, and he was the peg above the health centre, basically near where you are there. Um, I think he was either the first peg above or the second peg above. Right. Um, good area. He had 22.10. And then Tony Marshall was the first peg behind the swimming pool. We had £20.12. And then there was a tie for fifth, Dan Webb and Morris Mobs. Um, obviously, these were 86, 87, still doing the business. Um, he had £20. They both had £20.10. Oh, brilliant. So, yes. Yeah. I think there was a 19, 14, um and then I think me and Steve Harwood both had 19.4. So, um, yeah. And considering it's been pretty rough conditions, a lot of cold water's come down, a lot of water's come down, and um, yeah. that river still keeps throwing up really consistent match weights. Yeah. yeah. It's great, isn't it? It really is good. Um, are there any matches over the Christmas period on there? Not on there, I don't think, though. No. 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 What are your plans? With I don't know what, what the next steps is for after Christmas because normally we'd have the Hay Jack starting straight away. Yeah. Um, there's meant to be matches on the town well and this year there's meant to be like team three or four and 
individual matches on Saturdays on the Welland and the Glen, but I don't think that's going to happen. It's obviously, the tier thing. Um, I don't know. Really don't know, mate. <sighs> it's a shame, so, isn't it? Because um, it just feels like everything's on hold. It just it 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 wants to start, but it can't start. And it's all very understandable. It's very yeah. serious what's going on, and angling's just angling. But um, yeah, it's. <clears throat> it's a very frustrating, excuse me, <clears throat> a very frustrating situation all around. And you guys, I've, I've seen firsthand how well these matches are run. Just about every single one, well, they all are absolutely brilliant. But um, yeah, I suppose common sense has to pre- prevail with the travelling, really. But there we go. Right. Um, anything else that you want to add this week? No, mate, no. I'm just going to do one final thing. Can't leave without putting this back on. Just be a little bit festive. Bear with me. There we go. At least I'm making the effort. Yeah, so I think everyone will understand that's why we're going to have the week off next week because um, obviously with a lack of matches and everything that's going on, people will be busy doing other things. That um, yeah. that's kind of makes sense. So we'll, we'll be back first week in January. Um, I can see this actually just carrying on till the close season. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, frustrating. Um, I'm not sure about what we're in tier two, aren't we? I was thinking maybe maybe we go pike fishing and do the podcast from the bank. That might be yeah, that something might, different. Something different. Something completely different. I have to get my head around how the logistics of the recording and everything will go. But uh, we might try something. Um, Somewhere quiet out of the way from the road. Yeah, it means we've got to walk. So you haven't got cars going. <laughs> Mm. wind is the enemy when we do this isn't it that's the problem yeah we'll sort something out um i think that just brings us to say merry christmas to everybody yeah get out there do a bit of fishing do a lot of eating um <laughs> i was gonna say look um enjoy your time with your loved ones but um if you're in tier four you can't even do that no no so Obviously, everyone keeps saying... Enjoy your own company. Yeah, enjoy your own company if you're in Tier 4. Tier 3, I don't know what the rules are for that. Tier 2, it's, again, very strange. But um, it's a very strange time for everybody. Just everyone keep safe. Have a lovely Christmas. And um, we'll be back in the new year with uh, the next episode. And, uh, yeah, let's get out there. Let's do a bit of fishing. And let's um, try and catch something. So it just leaves me to say goodbye. And Alex... Goodbye. There we go. Have a good Christmas. Beautiful. This has been Tales from the Tackle Shop, a Fenland Fishing TV production.